really love to take questions from the audience. Nobody? Come on. Please. Yes, that in the back, the Reverend. Uh, I'm a criminologist, and I, I guess what I'm kind of struggling with right now is uh, based on our young people and the target of the vaccine and law. Uh, how is this going to affect our the Bill of Rights and, uh, and the laws of which it stands for and the Constitution for the young people? Uh, it seems like our kids <coughs> leave home and grandkids leave home and go to school, and then all of a sudden, something is through at them. And they come home and say, Mama, we, we're going to take the shots before you. So what, what are we going to prepare ourselves for? I think that's a great question on uh, about uh, our rights uh, with that. And I go back to the Fourth Amendment here. The right of the people to be secure in their persons against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. Well, is there anything more personal than being injected in your body with a substance of unknown? Um, anything more? If you choose, that's fine. But um, I, I think mandatory is the critical word here. I don't know your health situation, but I know my health situation, and I would like to have my freedom to choose the medicines that I take. What I put and what I ingest in my body, is there anything more personal than what you actually put inside your body. And so I think, uh, the, I, I think we as, um, as free people must say that mandatory is not acceptable. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and you know, there are several different vaccines, potential vaccines out there. I don't know the efficacy. There's all, always going to be side effects. <clears throat> but, I, but I believe in the right to choose what you want to do and to choose whether you want to. Now, you know, COVID itself, as far as I can tell, has a 99% survivability. The, the best vaccine is somewhere between 90 to 95%. Sounds like I'm better off getting COVID. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, what's the, uh, I, I, the um, I, I think there is a lot to be worried about anytime the government says, you shall do this regardless of what your religious beliefs are, what your personal health is, uh, and, and, and the way this can be enforced is by employment, education, and travel. And those are severe restrictions to people in their persons and, and in our rights of to assemble and to speech and to worship. And so I encourage everybody to do your own research to find out what is best for your personal health. And be very wary when someone says that you shall do this because of the common good. The co nobody, there is no common good person out there. It is somebody saying, well, we think this might be good for the common good. And there's a, the history of medicine is replete with examples of things that were done for the common good medical experiments on people, and that I reject because I trust individuals to make their own decision. I do not trust unelected government public health officials to tell me how I should live my life. How about another question? Yes, ma'am. My husband is Senator Jim Toms, and he won't raise his hand. <laughs> well, thank you for inviting right. I will. <laughs> I appreciate your, your uh, presentation today. It's very good. Everything was right on the button. Um, just so we have a group of folks here, maybe, uh, maybe it's worth sharing this with you. Um, i give you an example of what we're dealing with here with the society of people, our civilization, our society in this country. Our side, it's been my observations, simply will not take action. The other side, we see they, they get out in the streets, they make a noise and they get attention, and they get movement going. It's my impression that our side just doesn't want to get their hands dirty. And I'll tell you, I'm not trying to be cond condemning here, but a few years ago, as an example, I asked the LSA, that's, a, that's the organization at the State House, that would draft the bill. And I asked them to draft the bill for me that would allow for prayer back in public schools. Now, the attorneys that's working on the bill said, Senator, I'm afraid this won't 
get anywhere because you're going to get a lot of heat over this bill. I said, that's fine. I understand that. I'm, I'm doing this for a reason. They said, well, I don't know whether it would pass the state constitution or the federal constitution. I said, that's fine. I understand that. I said, just, just draw the bill up for me. So they did, and I got the first draft of it, and it said uh, would require prayer in public school. I, I sent it back and said, no, no, I, I don't want the word require, allow. Mm -hmm. So we got the bill right. I filed the bill, and I told my staff, now there's going to be calls coming in on this, so be braced. And they did. Emails flowed in, phone calls came in, and I, I told them, I want to keep a running tally of who's against it and who's with it. And we did. And I was told all kind of things. People asked me, don't I understand separation of churches? I got it all. The bill never got a hearing. It didn't get assigned. But it sure did get attention. The media was on it. And when we counted up how the calls and emails came in, those that was far from me, was, that should have been with me, was zero. I got not one phone call or email Senator, what can we do to help? Not one. So I got my answer. Now this year I filed a bill a couple weeks ago that goes after these county health boards. It's going to get attention too. Because, as you said, these people who are not elected here in Denver County, the guy that's in charge of the county health board has never helped. He doesn't have a medical degree that I know of. He was a township trustee some years ago. But he's now in a position as many county health boards up and down the state, to use something that we didn't have this time last year, this COVID. Typically, they was involved in taking care of overseeing that restaurants was maintaining cleanliness in their restaurants and food preparation and all that, septic system inspections, things like that. But they've used this here as a weapon to put an iron boot on the people's throat. And no so, doubt. So my bill will take that power away from them. With COVID, they will have no authority and if they do try to exercise anything with a, an outright violation with regard to COVID, they can't impose a fine. It would have to go to the either an county executive or the commissioners. Somebody that's elected would have to make the decision, not them. And it also will have a, a clause that they can't hire contractors outside the agency that they're, some of them are doing to go in and spy on restaurants and stuff. And also they will have a penalty clause. If they've been anybody's been damaged or an entity, they can file civil charges against the county health board or that individual. So I'm bringing this up because I'm going to see how much backing I'll get on this. Because I, I appreciate what you said. You were apt to but until citizens, till our side starts taking some action, turn the stinking T V off, That's right. pass on a ball game this That's weekend. Right. Yeah. and find out who their elected officials are and what they need to be doing and how they can assist and watch the website for these bills as they surface because the other side is going to have bills too. So I only take this moment just to share that with you. I agree with you and I thank you for filing that. We have a similar bill that's been filed in the Missouri um, uh, legislature because uh, the shutdowns have happened. Um, um, well, as I say, they, they've just been... Um, you know, some places get shut down, some places don't get shut down. And it's, the, and, and it's that kind of uh, difference that, um, uh, it, that it makes it so awful for the business owner because you don't know if you're going to be a target of this unelected health inspector. And we have a similar problem where we have people who are, uh, who are uh, health directors who do not have the qualifications that they're supposed to have to hold that job. Uh, and just because you're uh, in a position of public health effect, uh, d director does not mean you know anything about ep epidemiology. You're just going along with the crowd. And I do think that all of this is just a method of control. On, but what we have found is that we are sheeple. We are not standing up for our rights. We, and the fact that 35 million Californians are willing to get shut up in their home and they're not out in the street demonstrating. I don't understand what they're drinking, what kind of water they're drinking in California. I've participated in a number of rallies in St. Louis about this issue, about how it has been so capricious, the shutdowns. And one of the bills, the, the bill that's filed currently in the Missouri legislature, uh, one of the ways, and you may want to consider this, is a time limit. 
Okay, maybe there's an emergency, but you cannot let the emergency go on longer for two weeks unless there is a public vote by elected officials who are responsible and accountable to the voters. Because we have people now who have no accountability, who are making these decisions. And you know, there's this, a lot of this was sold with the idea of we, if we don't do this, people will die. Yeah. Now, but I don't, th but you know, as Yogi Berra said, people are dying every day who haven't died before. It's, uh, uh, death happens, and there is no cure for death. X number of people are going to die from COVID, but I believe that 10x number of people will die because of the economic shutdown. Mm -hmm. Livelihoods are lives. And to say that your livelihood is not as valuable as a life is to misunderstand what a livelihood is. Okay. Your, your, uh, the, what you do in your life, the business that you do, the profession that you engage in, is part and parcel of your life. And what have we seen over the last eight months? Huge spikes in <clears throat> depression, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, su uh, suicide, marriage breakups, family dysfunction. All of these things are a direct result of economic shutdown. And I think when the economy was shut down in March, whether it was purposeful or not, I think there wasn't a calculus made on the consequence of destroying people's economies and the consequence that would happen in life of people. And I have, I have seen some studies that the, the drug overdose is off the charts, but I'll tell you what is really off the charts in St. Louis where I live. We have had many on the order of, I think it's a hundred more deaths by murder than we have of deaths <coughs> by COVID. So um, the fact that the murder rate has been allowed to shoot up, I think is a consequence of the economic shutdown, along with the consequence of, of a back down of law and order. We are seeing the fracturing and fraying of our society, and partly is because what we're doing today coming together in fellowship is not allowed in most parts of this country. And that is what we need to get back to. And, you know, we don't have to rally in the streets. Just get together a group of 50 people. Each one of you, find another group of 50 people to get together because I know I am hungry for this kind of social interaction. And everybody I've seen and talked to have been so grateful for some kind of real communication because there is no real communication on a video screen. Mm -hmm. Another question or comment? Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> it's a great, great speech. And going back to what Jim said, like I really felt that, I'm talking to my wife about this, I felt that the tide of my feelings trump your rights has, has really escalated here in the past couple of years. And I've really felt that our back has been against that time. Um, and I, I, I think it's great what you said, Jim, but I guess my question would be, do you have any examples? Um, you look at the gospel, the best form of spreading the gospel is through discipleship, one-on-one -on -one discipleship. Do you have any examples of how we can help this movement beyond um, a one-on-one -on -one setting, and, and, and I get the squeaky wheel gets the oil, <clears throat> the press loves the chaos, but beyond that, like, what's the avenue that we get this movement out? And I'm, I'm sort of at a loss, because uh, I haven't seen any effective conservative movement that, that, that's out there. Well, one-on-one -on -one is certainly is critically important, because you're right. The best way to influence somebody is, is eyeball to eyeball. And one-on-one -on -one is extremely important. But there's also broadcasting the message and getting it out to a greater group. There is no question, and I think this is, goes back to why so many people we know are sheeple. They don't want to rock the boat. They want to secure their little bit 
and yeah, they don't like what's going on, but you know, don't harm me. And that is because, because the bullying that has been done on, um, on uh, personal beliefs has been so intense uh, that people don't want to enter the fray. This is why the luckiest thing that ever happened to me was to have Phyllis Schlafly as my mother. Because what I learned from her at an early age is take the slings and arrows. Uh, and you know what? It can't hurt you. Just keep going. And, and it's, it's hard to get over that first bump. I mean, I have been canceled on social media. I've been called every name in the book. I'm sure I will continue to be. But you go back to sticks and stones can't, uh, uh, you know, words will never hurt me. Uh, the, um, you have to put yourself out there and be willing to take the slings. Because if you don't, then, and if you, if you wait for someone else to do it, it may never happen. It's got to be you to do it. And what my mother always said is that she built Eagle Forum with an idea, not that she was the leader, but that she would train and make leaders, that people would be learning, would learn how to organize themselves so that they could come go out and be leaders in their community. It's federalism. It's just like our country. We can't look to Washington to make all the decisions. It's we have to start here in Evansville to make our community and to make Evansville a better community and to tr and, and the hope that it will go out from there. Uh, and um, making other, in, empowering and encouraging other leaders is what's critical here because we don't want to stand up because we think nobody else is standing up. But you, it's amazing how much when you stand up and speak, somebody else will say, thanks for doing that. Now, they may only whisper it to you in the ear, but they'll say, thanks for doing it. Now, I, now uh, Senator Jim's going to say, but he tried that with the um, prayer in school, and nobody uh, called him to say that, good job. Well, not even your, your, your wife. She didn't even call to say good job on the... Uh, <laughs> I don't <laughs> Zero phone calls. You couldn't even find a, you know, one of your kids to make a call. <laughs> you don't ask. Your mom. Not a phone call or an email. Naturally, my wife. And I knew people support me, but they didn't say anything. That's the problem. If you don't make any noise, you, you, you got to, you know, you got to speak out. And um, there's ways to do it. And I can tell you some. Some I don't want to tell you. No, but I, I mean that's. But that you're you're making an excellent point is that ultimately as conservatives we think of we don't think of ourselves as rabble rousers we're not into uh, property destruction or riots or uh, mayhem um, but um, and and there but there is civil disobedience and there is rule of law and I think it's critically important that that we continue to press our issues with credibility and authority because one thing we have learned is that ultimately the United States is a center-right country. People want the rule of law. They want justice. They want, uh, uh, they, they want the freedom. Uh, and, and sometimes it just needs to be explained to them or help them out. But everybody's got their, their hot button issue that they'll, they'll start uh, protesting and, and doing signs. And I'll just, well, one moment, I'll just give you an example. We had all these shutdowns in, um, in St. Louis, but what really got the, the uh, protest rally going was when our county executive closed the youth sports, when he said, you can't play ball. And all the moms came out suddenly <laughs> saying, what do you mean my kid can't play ball? So, I, so you know, the limits, uh, you know, there, there comes a moment where even people who are scared to march in the street will march in the, street, uh, in the street, and maybe it's taken their football away from them. But, uh, you know, do that and they'll get in there. But, yes, I'm sorry, you had to... The one person that really drew out people was our president. Mm -hmm. Look at his rallies. Mm -hmm. People that wasn't... You know, didn't you, you didn't know they was here, according to anybody else. You know, they, they you mean were, the deplorables? Mm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the deplorables. They showed up, and without masks, most of them. Of course, he had them at the airport because he wasn't allowed to have them in the building. Mm -hmm. But he found a way around it, 
and people showed up and that was leadership because then people that felt like they was in trouble they they rallied and got together mm -hmm. how wonderful it would be if there was more people that could do that same thing not necessarily you know tens of thousands of people but every little bit helps you had a question yeah i wanted to you know have a little bit of a question a little bit of a uh, what what do you, what can you give for young people the motivation? Because I see, like you said earlier, uh, we see a lot of young people want this fairness, and the left keeps uh, pandering to to my generation uh, about fairness, equality. But I don't really see it. I really see it as uh, a uh, herd. Uh, I call it. I saw it on um, social media. It's called her. Conformity? Conform well, there is a, there, there's a tremendous desire to conform and not stick out, and this exactly. is not this is not a new phenomenon. This has always existed. Yeah. People like to get along. People don't like to make uh, waves. People like to be. People like when people like them. People don't want to take positions that are not liked. People want to uh, people want to be friends, and uh, uh, and so um, and so there's a tremendous force to go along with the program. And so social media, unfortunately, has really accelerated this phenomenon because if you, if you seem to say anything that might be slightly skeptical uh, or inquisitive, you'll get beat down and saying, don't you know that you're not supposed to say that? You know, shut up. Um, and and this, this desire, and it's bullying is uh, to bully people to shut up and not express their views. I think um, a skepticism and a, a, a critiques are good. Are they good for science? They're good for politics? They're good for a healthy society? And if everybody believes the same thing, that makes me scratch my head and say, wait a second, it can't be if everybody believes the same thing. There's just, uh, there, there, there are multiple ways of looking at it, and we want more voices, not fewer voices. So I would, my recommendation is to go back to the beauty of the language in these first, in these first 10 amendments, because the beauty is free speech. You know, why shouldn't, shouldn't I have the ability to express speech? Well, you know, your speech is hate speech. Well, you may, decide that it's hate speech, but that's your feeling. And I think the gentleman over there talked about feelings over facts. You still have the ability to have speech. And yeah, there is speech that might be hurtful, or, or somebody may not like your speech. But the answer to that is not to suppress speech, because that's not who America is. America is about expression, self-expression. And I remember a, a couple of years ago, I was talking to a friend whose daughter had moved to Europe. And her daughter was being swept up with some of these uh, currents that were happening that, that the mother was a little concerned about. And she said, well, I don't understand why she doesn't stand up and say something. And I said, well, she does not ha she's living in a foreign country. She does not have this behind her back to stand up for free speech. She might very well get in trouble by if she expresses something against the government in a foreign country. So we have something of high value here. And so what I suggest to you and your friends, your young friends and social group, is to recommit yourself to these words because how can anyone reject or not like the beauty of the words in the First Amendment and what they, they the protections and rights and liberties and freedoms that we can enjoy that the rest of the world wants. That's why they want to come here, because we have it, but we have to use it and protect it and exercise it. That's why I love the word exercise. This is the exercise we need to be doing. Yes, sir. Uh, I want to thank you for allowing me to open that, because, of course, there's an air going on there. And uh, I just wanted to join you on the close here, and I have the same book in my hand, uh, and the senator has been an influence for us all. And I want to add this right here in uh, Article 3, if you don't mind, those that may have it, 
I'm just going to read Article 3, 4, and 5. Uh, just a couple words out of Article 3 says this word, judicial power. Article 4 says full faith. Judicial power, full faith. The action of the Articles of the Bill of Rights in reference to the Constitution is all about full faith. The judicial part is to keep you in your place. If I am wrong, we have a senator sitting here. Keep you in your place. But full faith brings on action. There are men and women of God here as well. The final one, number five, says the Congress. Listen to that. Three things. Judicial, full faith, and Congress. The senator has faith, so he becomes our congressman at the same time he's a senator. But he also has to act on the judicial rules and regulations that are guided. If we're going to change anything, we have to be like his title, based on his faith, and the authority that he's been given. I do believe, if I'm wrong, Correct me. That's what's in God's house. All three of those. Thank you. I want to follow up on that by talking about full faith. Uh, because full faith and credit, our economic system exists because we make a loan and we believe, we have credit, that you will pay back the loan. What, what this distrust and masking and social distancing has done this year is to sow dissent and, and uh, fear among people, thus losing the full faith in other people. That we distrust people now, and we're now afraid that if we loan the money, they won't, loan, they won't pay it back. That credit, that full faith in credit, is such an incredible, important part of our economic system, which preserves our political system. And that is why. I just, I don't like masking, I don't like social distancing, because how can I have full faith and credit in my human beings if I can't see, talk, and touch them? Thank you all very much. Amen.